Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy New Year. I'm Pastor Karen. I'm excited to be with you, uh, I think, for the next six weeks. I'm, this is the first time I've ever taught this subject. It's stages of faith. So um, you know how, I don't know if you learned in high school or if you went to college or any kind of um, education, if you learned about psychological development and how human beings develop psychologically and as we age and mature, we go through different stages of development. There's some theories out there that's similar uh, in our faith development. And I was first introduced to this idea in college and I loved it. I loved this idea that we can grow in our spiritual journey and there's um, evidence of a kind of journey that humans go on that we all kind of share together and yet it's still an individual path for each one of us. One of the things we'll be talking about is what does faith mean? When I wrote my senior thesis on this idea of stages of faith in college, and I didn't get the grade I wanted. <laughs> Nevertheless, I persevered. Um, one of the critiques I got from one of my professors was that stay, uh, faith is a gift. And it's pure grace, and there's nothing we have to do with it in order for it to grow. In fact, there's nothing to do with it. He really challenged me and I pushed back and said, I kind of disagree with that. I feel like for me, and I couldn't articulate it this well 20 some years ago, for me, faith is a relationship. And in a relationship, I have some involvement in it. It's a back and forth. And in this relationship with God, that it, that's going to change me. So what I like about this stage of faith idea is that it tracks the way human beings change as we grow and develop, but also as we grow in our relationship with God. So because this is the first time I've ever taught this, I want you to um, interrupt me when you feel confused or a question comes up, okay? Uh, and take notes so that you can remember the questions later. What we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to a book called The Critical Journey. You don't have to read it. You may want to, but you don't have to. This book tracks a, this, this particular stage of faith th that we're going to explore together for the next few weeks. If you look on the back of your handout, and Fr Fred, we can come back to this picture, or if you're flexible enough, you could show it. <clears throat> this is a picture of the stages of faith. I'm throwing Fred for a loop. I told him I'd do this later in the, in the presentation. You'll see that there are six stages of this faith life and in between stage four and stage five is something called the wall, which for me is the most interesting part of this journey. Of this, um, we, we move through our life and this often happens at midlife, this wall experience. And I'm really looking forward to talking about this with you. So uh, hold on to this and I'll, I'll have it available uh, each week. Okay, do you feel like you have a good idea of what we're going to be talking about? Yeah? Okay, okay. <clears throat> because we're so early in the new year and um, I, I don't have a good, uh, great PowerPoint, so we'll be following along more on this uh, handout. Hopefully in the next few weeks I'll have a PowerPoint so you can look at the, the um, screen and we can have it available for people who are watching online. But I just want to begin with this quotation. It's the very first quotation that opens this, this book that introduces this critical journey, stages in the life of faith. Whatever comes into your heart and mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Whatever comes into your heart and mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. 
I really appreciate this quote because I think sometimes I lose track of how much my, my experience of God and my thoughts about God shape who I am as a person. It shapes how I interact with other people. It shapes the way I spend my day. It shapes uh, how I feel about myself and, and uh, the world. If I lose track of my idea and, and belief that God is good, I can sometimes feel despair because the world's so hard. But if I can return to, oh wait, I believe in a good God, that can help me get recentered in how I am experiencing myself and relationship with other people and the world. So one of the things I'd like you to keep in mind is what comes into your heart and your mind when you think about God? And how does that shape who you are as a human being? The next little um, paragraph under that comes right from the introduction of this critical journey book and, and philosophy. The spiritual journey is deceptively simple and at the same time, highly complex. Our respect for this journey deepened as we wrote this book. Describing this paradox of spirituality is difficult and can really only be lived into. This is why the journey is so profound. And that is why it is critical. It is life itself. The critical journey is, at its core, a description of the individual's spiritual journey. Our response to, or faith in, God with the resulting life changes. There's a lot in this little paragraph. I just want to lift up how, I'm sure you've all experienced this too, that the spiritual journey is simple and really complex. That's a paragraph, or not a paragraph, a paradox, that two things that seem to be opposites can both be true at the same time. Our spiritual journey or our faith, our relationship with God can be really simple and at the same time high, highly complex. Spirituality is something that we really need to live into. As Lutherans, and in our tradition, we oftentimes get faith, we get caught up in our head. We think that our faith is what we believe. And that's really true. We're, we're, we have great theology. And we have a great image of God. And what we believe really matters. But the spiritual journey is something that we live into. And this stage of life idea is that our spiritual journey is actually our life. That our whole life is this journey of spirituality that we're, we're going at with God and with other people. In your groups today, I did raise up some questions at the bottom about what is, how do you respond to the phrase spiritual journey and how is that related to the word faith? So I would like you to just wrestle with that in your, in your group today. What's the difference, is there a difference between how we th what we think about faith and what we think about when we hear the phrase spiritual journey? Are there any initial comments about that? That's a big question at 9.30 or 9.45 in the morning. <laughs> okay. As a way to introduce you to these stages of faith, a, a group created videos. There are two that we're going to watch together today. The first one is uh, an introduction, and it also covers stages one, two, and three. 
And then we're going to get into the second video, which covers stage four, the wall, stage five, and stage six. So I'm going to stop talking. We'll watch these videos together. Uh, please jot down anything you notice or any questions you may have. And then we'll talk about the videos afterwards. We'll talk about these stages of faith. Great? OK, let's go for it. Many of us discover something surprising about spiritual growth after we've been at it for a while, which is that by nature we can't predict where it's headed. Because we discover we're going into a country we haven't yet visited, and maybe one that no one we know has visited. And maybe we feel the threat in doing something like that. Yes, for ourselves, since evidently we now have no idea what we're doing. But also, will it cost us friends or family members who are not at a similar point? Will they judge us or tell us we've made some horrible mistake? If so, why would anyone embark on a journey like that? Happily, others have thought about this over the millennia, and some have tried to chart what we might discover as we go, looking at what we learn from great saints along with what we learn from our own and others' stories. These people point us towards a whole lot of hope for what's in front of us, even if we have the occasional crash along the way. A relatively recent discussion of this journey of faith is a book by a counselor named Janet Hagberg and a pastor and theologian named Robert Gulick called The Critical Journey, Stages in the Life of Faith. They describe a journey in six potential stages that begins with a first flush of excitement about encountering a God greater than we'd imagined we could hope for, and goes all the way until perhaps we become like a great saint. Quite a profound journey indeed. Their stories can of course progress from one level to the next, even as they winnow along the way. But they emphasize that we can also loop back at will to stages that fit where we're at at a given time. They suggest ideas like that at the moment, one of their stages might feel like home to us, that that stage provides like a home base for us to venture out to other stages, even as we'll gravitate back there. All right, let's get rolling. So Hagberg and Gulick call their stage one the recognition of God. Here's where we experience the first flush of stumbling upon something amazing. God is real. God's awesome. We're humbled at the opportunity we seem to have stumbled upon. Why didn't people tell us about this? I know why. Maybe they didn't know about it. It's very exciting. Hagberg and Gulick tell us, here, we believe our lives are orchestrated by God, whose perfect will promises harmony and peace for everyone who follows God. We trust people implicitly, but especially those who share our faith. A possible example from the Bible might be King David, wondering why no one is taking on Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God, he says. Uh, possible downsides of stage one might be that superstitions might fit in here, a belief that you're going to have success if you play the game by God's rules. But what if you don't know God's rules? Who, who could help you out? This leads us to their stage two, the life of discipleship. So they tell us that here, many people find the move to the second stage is strongly tied with a recognition of and a desire to follow a significant leader or a belief system. We want and need to be led and taught and discipled. We develop a good feeling that these are my kind of people. Maybe you find yourself thinking about them as having found your tribe. A possible example from the Bible might be the role that Israel plays in the Old Testament as being the people of God. Now, this isn't just a conservative thing. They tell us, for some people, a cause itself is so compelling that it becomes the leader. It tells us what principles and behavior we should follow. So hunger relief or evangelism or healing or racial and LGBTQ justice, these are the sorts of causes we might ascribe to. At this stage, people see the cause or the leader as the answer because it's really enlightened and changed them. And they become enthusiastic to see other people have the same experience and they might feel confusion or disappointment when other people don't seem as excited as they are after hearing their leader speak or reading their books. They tell us that there's comfort at this stage, knowing that we personally don't have to figure out the answers, since someone else can help us with them. We don't even feel like threatening our comfortable stage of faith by launching into any uncertainty. Possible downsides of stage two might be that there's a tendency here, they tell us, to become legalistic and moralistic. The group's teachings and codes of conduct have to be adhered to or the offender is going to get kicked out. The more conservative side often will substantiate their viewpoint from scripture to make it unarguable. And we also run the risk of just getting restless. Maybe we gradually come to realize that the group is not exactly what we've been looking for. So we might accuse the group of changing and no longer being what we really need and we leave. But presuming we stick around, 
perhaps we enter Hagberg's and Gulick's stage three, which they call the productive life. So in the second stage, maybe you were given spiritual gifts inventory so you could figure out how who you were could find its place in God's work on earth. Or maybe that happened through personality profiles like the Myers-Briggs test or the Enneagram. But in this third stage, who we are becomes useful for God. People look up to us as we help them with their journey of faith. So Hagberg and Gulick tell us that it seems to be an almost insatiable period because everything's going so well. For some people, this is captured in the phrase, if God be for us, who can be against us? They suggest lots of scriptural examples, like, say, Deborah, who becomes so important in rallying and rescuing Israel. Possible downsides of stage three might be that no one can be around us, they say, without hearing our story and our trying to convert them to this thing we're into. We insist that they accept and participate in our experience because that makes us feel successful. We take personal satisfaction in having saved others from some horrible fate. When stage three starts turning bad for us, we're burning out, we're feeling unappreciated, they tell us, without knowing why. People didn't change in the ways we wanted them to or at the pace we expected them to. Usually the complaint boils down to one thing. Others disappointed us. We tried as hard as we could to make it happen. So this disappointment is about, I'm sorry to say, to lead to a crash. But the good news is that if we can find our way through that crash, maybe through a first experience of what great teachers have called the dark night of the soul, Hagberg and Gulick have a lot of good news to fill us in on about what comes after that. I'll see you soon for part two. Welcome back to part two of our brief look at the profound stages of faith that Janet Hagberg and Robert Gulick look at in their seminal book called The Critical Journey, Stages in the Life of Faith. So our first video looked at a journey of faith from its first enthusiastic beginnings, right up until it appears to be at the brink of a crash, maybe for good and ever. Let's pick up our journey right at that point of high drama. So their stage four they call the journey inward. And they tell us that this move from stage three to four is most likely precipitated by a crisis in our life or our faith. That crisis makes many of our former truths and answers inadequate or inappropriate for the next phase in the journey. They tell us that it would be great to think that most priests, ministers, and other spiritual leaders could be our guides through stage four. But the sad truth is that many of those leaders haven't themselves been led through the stage and haven't allowed themselves to question deeply or to become whole. So many of those to whom we often look most naturally for help turn out to be inadequate guides for this part of the journey. At this stage, our journey is intensely personal. It's difficult to share with others, which makes it hard to develop any sense of belonging. Possible scriptural examples for them are Jesus' friend Peter. So the Peter who emerged after Easter to lead the church after Pentecost was a really different Peter from the man for whom the cock had crowed as he betrayed Jesus. Or Elijah, who went from being God's great representative on earth to fleeing for his life and wondering what on earth just happened. To get to the stage of productive living, that their stage three. They tell us we learn things like obedience and innocence and belonging and being in the center. But at this stage, all we can say is that we're on the trail of a direction so vague and unclear that it's frightening. We know that we're no longer looking for an answer, though, which I think is a fascinating observation. They tell us when things go well at this stage, we experience a new kind of yielding. We relinquish our ego. Whereas before, we were more confident in ourselves now we're becoming deeply confident in God to take care of us totally. Paradox is the key. What's true is also false. That is, our church or our family represented God, but it didn't represent God. It can be an uncomfortable stage. Some people call it, they tell us, the dark night of the soul. It's a time of feeling withered and alone, of searching and not finding, or grieving and feeling a loss. We simply can't go through this wall that we hit here while working 60 hours a week. We need to set aside time for solitude, time to walk, to listen to God's voice, to think, to feel, to reflect. Hagberg and Gulick help us regroup here with some summary thoughts, telling us that in the first three stages, our faith or our spirituality takes its expression most frequently in ways that are prescribed by external standards, whether by the church, a spiritual leader, a book, or a set of principles. But stages four through six represent a diff difficult personal transformation and a re-emerging that require a rediscovery on a different level of what faith and spirituality are all about. These, they tell us, are inner healing stages, both spiritually and psychologically, for which the journey can't be prescribed. Their stage five, they call the journey outward. So in the first three stages, whatever problems we might discover in ourselves, whatever brokenness or maybe sin, we feel confident there's a plan out there for us to get past it. There's some wise person who's going to guide us through it. We're going to fix it. 
In stage four, we have given that up. At stage four, we meet ourselves, they tell us. We discover forgiveness, we experience healing. Yet the healing process and integration have to continue. At stage five, we grow into the full awareness that God truly loves us, even though we're never fully whole. So having come through this wall, this barrier in the fourth stage that we seemingly can't get past, we realize, you know what? We can be useful in a different way than we were in stage three, their productive life. Hagberg and Gulick tell us that here we experience a humor, cosmic and divine, that causes us to chuckle at things that might not have seemed funny before. We come to realize that God's purpose corresponds with our own deep longing and purpose that we weren't yet aware of, but it was there all along. I think back to earlier in my marriage where my wife and I would spend time trying to figure out what our callings might be. But here, we are told, we begin to experience God's choices for us as our calling. We're not in charge. We don't do the planning. So eventually, at this point, we're told we feel the striving cease, and we're not sure when it happened. We develop a deep calm or a stillness. We've learned what keeps us connected to God, and we've developed disciplines that promote our inner calm and clarity. And now we live out of our center. We're natural healers, and we're clear about our calling. And we've let go of our anger and grief over past wounds. Their stage six, they call the life of love. This might correspond to what the desert fathers and mothers call being pure of heart and so seeing God, or what some of them begin to call union with God. Here, Hagberg and Gulick tell us, we give our all without feeling that it means surrender or sacrifice. So in earlier stages, when we had a challenge in life, maybe some leader might tell us we just need to trust God, and so we take that as a challenge. We do our best to work up the trust we're gonna need. I will trust God. But here we find that we actually just do seem to trust God rather than working at it. They tell us it's not that we don't appreciate nice things here, like beauty, health, and happiness. We do. But we're not attached to nice things or to things in general. We travel light. Jesus' itinerant style of life reflected his detachment from earthly possessions. So he was often the guest of honor in a home or at a dinner. And he learned that God's call to him meant freedom from things and from stress. When a man asked him what he needed to do to know life, Jesus told him, sell his possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, become one of his disciples. Yet, we're told, we never find Jesus anywhere in the gospel fretting over food, clothing, or shelter. Rather, we hear him in the Sermon on the Mount exhorting his disciples to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, instead of worrying about food, drink, clothing, or what's coming tomorrow. In this sixth stage, we find we define ourselves less than we did even in the fifth stage. This stage represents not our work, our calling, our life, we're told, but it's the life we live in God. It's all about the transcendent life we live beyond ourselves. People on this stage will probably be uninterested in things like personality profiles or tests to discover their gifts, not because they're not self-reflective, but because they know themselves well now and aren't interested in being validated or recognized. Their looks at stages five and six, to me, seem a little bit less developed than their looks at stages one through four, maybe because they've spent less time in those stages. That said, many, maybe most, Christian mystics from throughout the centuries talk mostly about their stage six, about complete union with God. And that can feel like distant and inaccessible. It might not be clear how useful this would be to most people who are neither cloistered nor famous spiritual geniuses. But maybe Hagberg and Gulick offer us help to see this as just one more stage to be aware of that God might show us glimpses of as we do our best to chart our course this direction and see where it takes us. Okay, let's take a look at Hagberg and Gulick's summary of what their stages of faith offer us. Here's what they tell us. They say that their stage one, the recognition of God, humbles us. Their stage two, the life of discipleship, grounds us. Their stage three, the productive life, rewards and exalts us. Their stage four, the inward journey, unsettles us. The wall unmasks us. Their stage five, the journey outward, transforms us. And their stage six, the life of love, transcends us. The critical journey is is by no means the only way to look at the spectrum of a life of faith. But I hope you've nonetheless found their take on this journey helpful and comforting and motivating. So I like that last statement that he said that this does this isn't the only definition of a a life of faith or a journey of faith. It's just one helpful way for us to understand what it means to be spiritual people. Um, I find it helpful because it's a path 
that these researchers um, have discovered that many people experience. And it is a comfort to know that there are all kinds of people who walk this path of faith, and there are different ways that we experience God in different seasons of life. The most helpful thing for me about this, is, especially when I'm meeting with people in spiritual direction, and they tell me, I feel like I'm walking in darkness. I don't know where God is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I feel like I'm just lost. This tool helps me say to someone, you're not doing this wrong. You haven't messed up. This is part of the spiritual journey, is experiencing these times when we don't have any answers and we have way more questions. Um, and, and we sometimes feel like the rug's been pulled out from us, right? That's when we're going through a transition from one stage of faith to another. So for me, that offers great comfort, that when I'm going through a transition or a change in how I understand God and myself and our relationship and what life is all about, that it really is a natural thing that humans go through. So for the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time in each stage and explore it. I hope this does two things for you, that you learn about um, this development of faith, the stages of faith as an idea, and if you're interested, that you can do some self-reflection of when were there times when I experienced life in each stage, uh, and find examples of how you've experienced yourself in, in each of these different places on this journey. It's really important that we all acknowledge that no stage is better than the other. We all go back and forth in between all of them. We've experienced all of them at some point. Stage six is not better than stage one. Okay, so we need to just say that's a fact in this. We experience each of the stages at some point in our life. It also at the same time feels like the big wigs like Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King Jr live mostly their home stage is in that stage five or stage six. So we can explore that as what does that look like when a human being gets to that, that, that kind of an experience of life and faith where they're transcending themselves and experiencing unity with God. That's really interesting to me. What's also interesting to me is where do we as a community experience a stage of faith together. If we were to talk about word for women as a community, what stage of faith would we be in together? It's hard to answer that, but it's, it's worth just exploring and thinking about. So for the next few weeks, we'll look at each stage, um, and, and I hope to communicate clearly, because I don't want you to have to read this book, so, but you can if you want. Uh, if you have any questions, always interrupt me. I do want to go back to our um, handout. And just in the middle of the, the page, lift up these bullet points. Depending on your starting point, the critical journey addresses one or all of the following issues. The struggle to find meaning and wholeness, the crisis of values and identity at midlife, questions about the spiritual journey, the quest for self-actualization, and the healing of early religious experiences. The critical journey does not tell you exactly how or when to move along your spiritual journey. It does not offer any formulas for spiritual growth, but it does describe the various phases of our spiritual journey and illustrate how people act and think when in those phases. We can't force ourselves to move to a new place. We just have to kind of wait it out and be patient and pray through it and be with God in that. What's your question? Right. Right. 
Yes, thank you, yes. So she, she said, I'm assuming that we don't just go one, two, three, four, five, six. We can get all the way to six and something can happen and we might find ourselves back in an experience of stage one. Yes. Light, we go through life and, and have seasons and, and it, you notice he said, well, go through transitions when crisis hits, right? We've probably all experienced that. A crisis hits and our faith is different. We come out as a different person. So that's one of the things we'll talk about is how we do kind of bounce back and forth in these stages. At each season of life, though, we have a home stage where we're most comfortable. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. The life of discipleship is, is about how you find your understanding of who God is and what you believe from being in a community. And the community or a leader or a cause gives you what you believe. And then that helps you think about who am I and how do I want to live. The productive life is when you've got that sense of identity and you go out and you are on a mission and you're really living into that, that sense of community that you've experienced based on the community or the leader that you're following. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to explore some of these big questions. Um, I put these reflection questions for your group I would love for you to talk about, uh, to really dig into what is this idea of a spiritual journey and what does it mean that our whole life is a spiritual journey? And maybe even notice some times in your life when you've gone through some changes and, it, and you just realize, I don't believe what I used to believe and now I'm going into a new understanding of who God is and who I am and what's meaningful to me. Um, I, I lifted up in the last two questions some experiences of stage one and stage two. So the second to last bullet point in the reflection questions is about stage one. What is one of your first memories of an awareness of God in your life? Where were you? Were you alone or with another person? What did that feel like? How would you describe that recognition of God? What was it like when you first became aware? You, you think there's a God. Were you real little? Were you older? What was it like? This, the final question is um, about stage two. Have you experienced a community, group of people, or a person who helped you understand faith and gave you a sense of security about God? And what was that experience like for you? So th that's just to dabble in some reflection about each of th these first two stages. All right. Well, I'm excited. I hope that this is clear for you. Please stop me if you ever feel confused. Um, and may I say a prayer as we break up and you go have a good conversation? Thank you, God, for the gift of our lives as human beings, as individuals, and as people who are in community sharing life together and with you. May this uh, learning, this stage of faith uh, theory be helpful for us, help us uh, discover what we've been through in our life, and help us gain some understanding and clarity um, and a new insight into who we are and who you are and how we share this life together. I give you thanks for this new year and I pray that anything we hope for um, can just be shared with you in our joyful anticipation of what may come. I give you thanks for the gift of Jesus and pray in his holy name. Amen. All right, good to be with you. See you next week.